Hey everybody, it's my pleasure to step in for Alberto, uh, Daniel's host, who had something urgent come up this morning and couldn't make it, unfortunately. Uh, so Daniel's a junior leader, postdoctoral fellow uh, with Inaki Ruiz Trio at the uh, Institute de Biologia Evolutia in Barcelona, where he's been since 2018. Barcelona is also where he'll be starting his own independent research group in September 2021, after being uh, awarded one of the prestigious ERC commission, uh, I guess ERC starting grants, to work on the abundant yet entirely unknown microbial plankton species that he's identified as a postdoc. Dan has a long history at the forefront of bioinformatics and computational biology, especially for the study of ecology and evolution. After graduating in computer science from Williams College, Dan worked on human and primate genomics at the Broad Institute with Eric Landers Group uh, as an associate computational biologist. After that, he went to Berkeley where he got his PhD in molecular cell biology with an emphasis in computational and genomic biology. Together with his joint supervisors, Nicole King and Mike Eisen, Dan sequenced and assembled novel quantiflagellate transcriptomes, identifying in these unicellular eukaryotes several genes previously thought to be unique to animals, like toll-like receptors, extracellular matrix, hi, sorry, you can tell Alberto wrote this and I am reading it for him, hydrolinidase, I do not know how to pronounce that, it's okay, I'll move on, and notch delta pathway genes. After his PhD, he went to Europe for his postdoc, more specifically to the research group of Colombia, of Colomban de Vargas at the Station Biologique de Roscoff, where he first started working on metagenomic and metatranscriptomic data from the Terra Oceans project, later transitioning to his current position in Barcelona. Dan, we are delighted to have you here. Thanks for coming and uh, take it away. Uh, so first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm really excited to talk to, to you, although I can only see one of you now. I'm excited to talk to you. Um, and uh, I know that um, these days there's there's a whole lot of uh, video meetings uh, competing for your time, so I'm grateful for, for, for you attending uh, this one. So I'll get right to it. So um, uh, I'm going to be speaking about community biogeography and transcriptional activity in, in, in the surface ocean. And first of all, I'll start with a couple of slides to explain um, why I, I'm interested in this, how I, how I first got into this. Um, and it started during uh, my PhD. So during my PhD, uh, we uh, isolated, cultured, um, described, and sequenced uh, a number of, of quantiflagellate species. And we were studying them because quantiflagellates are the closest relative to animals, and we wanted to understand animal evolution. Uh, but during this time of looking through the microscope, I was really fascinated by all the cool things that the organisms were, were doing. Um, in this case, uh, there's this monoculture here that has uh, some colonial cells, some swarmer cells, and they have all these interesting behaviors. And so what I wondered was, um, he, here, this is, this is happening in the, in the confines of the lab, um, but what's happening in the wider world, um, in particular in the scope of the ocean? And this is a really big jump, and I'm aware of that. Um, but uh, Basically, the question I had was, what um, are these organisms that we grow in lab for, for one purpose? Um, what are they doing in, in the ocean at large, and what ecological functions might they have? And I'm showing you this video um, to emphasize the fact that the ocean uh, is always on the move. In particular, plankton, which are uh, the definition of plankton, are organisms that cannot fight against the currents. So they basically go wherever the currents go. So. Uh, so basically, the world of the plankton is always on the move. Um, another, a couple other cool things to take from this video is that you can see, for example, uh, the Gulf Stream uh, up no, here. Sir. What's that? Oh, okay. Um, uh, and you can also see, uh, just to, re to remember later, these things that are called uh, Agulis rings, uh, which sort of are spun off of the Agulis current here at the at the, the most southern point of Africa. And there is this anticyclonic uh, water that sort of retains its identity as it moves across uh, the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean here. That's just something to keep in mind for later in the talk. Okay, so um, uh, why should you care about plankton? So two thirds of the surface uh, of the earth um, is the ocean. And actually um, half of the photosynthesis on the planet takes place in the ocean. Here's a, a sort of, um, an extreme example, this is a plankton bloom, which is so large that it can be seen from space. Um, but this is just to emphasize the fact that um, if we want to understand how energy uh, 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 is received from the sun uh, and then moves into other parts of Earth's ecosystem, we have to understand, of course, the half that happens in the ocean. 
This particular bloom happens to be from an organism called Emiliania huxleyi, uh, which is a haptophyte, and um, it has this cool extracellular structure that's actually made of calcium carbonate. So plankton also have other types of extracellular structures. For example, this species that I also studied uh, during my thesis, which is called Diaphanerica grandis. Uh, in, in the middle here, you see the, the vague outline of the cell, and it has this thing called a lorica, and this is actually made of glass. Um, uh, and uh, actually, uh, the sort of global uh, movement of uh, minerals like uh, silicon uh, and uh, calcium carbonate over geological time has a lot to do with, with the plankton. So I picked these examples to show you for a particular reason, uh, and that's because these organisms are all protists. <clears throat> so what are protists? So protists is sort of a definition by exclusion. Uh, that is, it's sort of organisms within a certain size range that aren't from any um, major known uh, multicellular lineage. And here I'm showing you a bunch of different images of all sorts of different plankton, and, and the key is, uh, sorry, protists, and the key is that they're very diverse. Uh, and they exist within this size range here, from roughly one micron to, say, on the order of up to 10 millimeters, with the bulk of them existing somewhere between, say, five microns and, uh, and say, a millimeter. And they're important um, because they occupy a size range between bacteria and animals, which basically means if we're trying to understand the ecology of the ocean or even of the land, they occupy this critical size range, which can be thought of as sort of a link in the food web between bacteria and animals or, say, viruses and animals. So if we want to understand the ecology of the surface ocean in this, in this case, we have, to, we have to study protists. Okay, so that's one reason that um, I think planktonic protists are interesting. But the other is actually that they represent the bulk of eukaryotic diversity. So here I'm showing you a fairly recent tree. And this tree uh, is all these lineages that you see here, most of which I'm guessing you, you don't recognize, is mostly made of protists. Um, in fact, the, the sort of main multicellular uh, macroscopic lineages that we know of are on relatively few branches of this eukaryotic tree of life. So for example, the brown algae are stromenopiles, land plants are chloroplastid, uh, chloroplastida, and rhodophytes, which is a red algae, are both within this supergroup archaeplastids. And then animals and fungi are actually both within the opisthocons, which is within the obozoa, which is within the amorphia. And the rest is protists, basically. So if we want to understand eukaryotic evolution, then we have to involve protists. So hopefully I've convinced you that protists are interesting uh, ecologically because they're a critical link in, in the global food structure. And also uh, they're interesting from an evolutionary perspective because they make up uh, the bulk of uh, uh, eukaryotic diversity. Okay, so now that I've hopefully convinced you of that, what, am I gonna, what are the specific things I'm gonna talk about today in relation to, to protists? Um, so the first question, um, is uh, do microbial ocean plankton form stable biogeographical communities? And if so, what are the factors that shape this biogeography? Um, and believe it or not, that's actually still somewhat of an open question. Uh, there's sort of this one hypothesis that anything, any organism below a certain size should be globally distributed, which would predict that there should be no uh, biogeography. On the other hand, we know that the plankton are always moving. Uh, and so it could be that the fact that the plankton are always moving inhibits the formation of some of stable biogeographies. Uh, the second question that we'll ask are what are the features of the my, microbial ocean plankton activity on a global scale? So boiled down to a few short words, question number one would be uh, where do plankton live, the eu eukaryotic plankton, and, and two, what are they doing? And we're going to try and answer those. So. How will we answer those? Well, we need a data set, and the data set um, was collected by this boat uh, called Tara Oceans. So here's Tara Oceans leaving Roscoff um, in the spring of 2009 at the beginning of a three-year trip to collect samples from across the world. Um, before you get too jealous, I actually um, was still doing my PhD when the sampling was, was carried out. So um, by the time I arrived, the sampling had already been finished, and I didn't, um, I didn't actually do any seafaring on a boat to collect any samples. So, uh, Tara's path uh, started in Roscoff uh, and then followed this red line around the world over the course of a three-year period. Um, actually, there, the, Tara was initially scheduled to uh, go uh, further um, towards Japan um, uh, and collect samples uh, uh, closer to Oceania and also to Japan, but actually this was um, when it was scheduled to go there was about the time of the Fukushima disaster, so um, the, uh, Tara had to be rerouted and take a slightly different route. Um, 
one, one important thing to remember, as I think I mentioned it earlier, is that th this was collected over quite a long period, so uh, across three years and across different seasons, of course. So uh, the data sets that I'll be telling you about are genetic data sets. So they were collected for six organismal size fractions. So a viral size fraction, a bacterial size fraction, and then four eukaryotic size fractions. And the fractionation was done physically with nets or filters. <clears throat> so um, the, the biogeography data uh, we have for all of the size fractions, but I'll be focusing mostly on the eukaryotic size fractions, although I'll be showing some data from the viral and bacterial. And the three types of genetic data that were collected are metagenomes. So this is as simple as uh, sucking all the organisms in, that were collected in that water sample down onto a filter and sequencing all of the DNA. Um, there was uh, metabarcoding done, and this was done by do doing a PCR for the V9 hypervariable region of the 18S ribosomal gene and then uh, sequencing that amplified region. And the metabarcodes are useful because they can, um, the, you, we can get to quite high depth and identify the organisms um, to a higher degree of certainty that are present. And I won't be presenting any data directly on this, but I'll be using it as a comparison point. The third type of data is metatranscriptomes. Um, and this was done similar to, to metagenomes, basically take all the organisms and suck them down onto a filter. Uh, but then do a poly A selection to select the eukaryotic mRNA and sequence it. And so this was only done for four eukaryotic size fractions. Okay, so let's get into uh, question number one from plankton biogeography. So we'll we'll do that with uh, with with the metagenomes. So um, sort of the disappointing thing about the metagenomes is that um, most of the DNA sequences are unidentified, and that's because um, we have representative genomes from a very, very small proportion of ocean plankton. So any given DNA sequence will not match to any known uh, genome in any database. But we can still use the data even if they're anonymous. And the way we do that is by doing pairwise comparisons. So here we have, a, say, a comparison between station 72 and station 149. And we'll just ask the simple question, how many DNA sequences do they share in common? So if we think of the metagenomes as representing a community, you have the metagenomes that are sort of a sample of the DNA present in a community here, and a meta metagenome that's a sample of all the organisms in the community here, and we're gonna ask how many DNA sequences they have in common, and that should tell us how similar the two communities are, which should allow us to ask questions about biogeography. So from all the pairwise comparisons, we can make a matrix, and here you see along both axes, uh, the different stations that were sampled, and the yellower uh, 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 um, a point in the matrix is, the more similar things are. So you see that there appears to be some patterns. So for example, there's a set of stations in the middle here that all appear to be more similar to one another than they are to any other set of stations. And I happen to know that, because I've stared at, at, at this long enough, that these are the stations that are lo located in or near the Antarctic. Um, but what we'd like to do is find a way to visualize this on the map. So how can we convert this matrix into something that we can see on, on a map? So what we'll do is we'll do a principal components analysis. Actually, we're using distances, so we'll use the principal coordinates analysis, and then we'll take the first three axes of variation. So here we have axis one from its minimum value to its maximum value, axis two, and axis three. And then we'll project all the stations onto these three axes. So here, station 72 might project here on axis one, here on axis two, and here on axis three. And then what we'll do is for each axis, we'll assign it to a color channel. So in this case, we'll assign this axis to be red. And so this value is here is zero red, and the value on the other end is maximum red, which, is, which would be 255, for example. And we'll do the same in the green channel and the blue channel, and that'll give us a composite color. So actually, if you, if you take the composite color of RGB for these values, then you get orange. So that'll allow us to give each station a color, and then we can visualize them on the map. So um, I'm, for the next slide, uh, as a warning, um, I'm about to take a little bit of poetic license for the oceanographers in the audience. Um, I'm going to basically e take each station's color and then interpolate it uh, on the ocean just to make it easier to see. Um, so this is what it looks like. So each station is an X, and then that station's color is interpolated uh, uh, across the ocean uh, such that we can see how this, the colors of those stations, uh, the patterns of the colors of those stations. Okay, 
So the first thing to to remark on is that there does appear to be a stable, some sort of stable biogeography, because this is collected over different seasons and over three years. And for example, some of the stations here were collected at the end of the of Chara's trajectory, and some of the stations here were collected at the beginning. So they are collected three years uh, differently in time. So there does appear to be some pattern where stations that are geographically closer to one another are more similar to each other than they are to other stations and the rest of the planet. Okay, so that's sort of mystery number one. So I just made a big deal about the fact that the plankton are always on the move. Um, so how is it that you get this sort of stable pattern over what we think is at least a three year period? So that's sort of mystery number one. Um, another thing uh, to look at here is that you see those Agulis rings that I mentioned earlier that sort of uh, spin off here from the Horn of Africa and retain their identity. They mix very slowly with the surrounding water. So Tara actually followed an Agulis ring uh, across the southern part of the Atlantic here. Uh, and so you see that it retains its identity before slowly mixing, uh, before mixing with water that uh, near on the eastern coast of South America. Um, and the third thing to note is that actually Tara sampled some upwelling zones. And upwelling zones are, uh, are known to be uh, significantly more nutrient rich than most of the open ocean, which doesn't have very many nutrients. And so uh, if you look at the three upwelling zones, so one here uh, that's off the, the western coast of Africa, another one here, and another one here, these three upwelling zones, although they're geographically uh, distinct, appear to have a somewhat similar color. Okay, so what this telling us is that, that there is a geographical signal, but there's probably also some signal for the environment. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna show you is um, a relatively uh, confusing slide. <laughs> Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through it slowly. So what we'll do is we'll take um, all of the colors of the stations, uh, that actually will take the matrix that led to those, and then we'll do a hierarchical clustering such that um, we'll codify what we mean by groups of stations that are more closely related to each other than they are to any other station. Before I do that though, I just uh, mentioned that for those of you who are oceanographers, this may remind you of Longhurst provinces, uh, which are provinces defined by Alan Longhurst based on satellite data of temperature uh, and chlorophyll A largely, and actually they do match up um, for this size fraction. So there's a, there's a remarkable correspondence. Okay, so here's this confusing slide. So in these big circles, you see the different hierarchical, hierarchical clusters, and within each circle are the stations that make up that cluster along with the color that they were assigned. Okay, so you can see that there's 11 clusters in this size fraction. Um, some of them are slightly bigger and some of them are slightly smaller. And you can see conveniently that the colors match up. Um, the, the, color, the color regime within any given cluster is the same. Um, although the color data were not used to make the clusters. The, it was the underlying matrix. Okay, and we're going to look at environmental differences by saying every time that there's a significant difference between the values of a given environmental parameter between two hierarchical clusters, then we're gonna put a line between them. And the wider the line, the bigger the difference. And this may look like a huge jumble, but that's sort of the point. It seems as if that within the organisms of this size fraction, there appear to be significant differences in a lot of environmental parameters, in particular phosphate, iron, and nitrate, which we know are important for photosynthetic organisms. And I'm showing you this to contrast it with what it looks like for larger organisms. So these are organisms between 180 microns and two millimeters. And the situation looks quite different. So uh, th first of all, the clusters themselves are quite a bit larger and they have a correspondingly larger geographical extent. And second of all, there are fewer and smaller environmental differences among the clusters. So this is sort of mystery number two. So, so mystery number one is how can we get a stable plankton biogeography in the face of all this movement? Mystery number two is how can we get different biogeographies for differently sized organisms? But we're, we're just gonna keep accumulating mysteries for now. Okay, so I've been telling you about uh, uh, ocean plankton always being on the move, and what I haven't shown you yet are data that compare the matrix that we saw before of the differences between communities at individual stations and ocean and ocean currents. So here, I'll show you that now. So this is what it looks like. So here, um, for every dot is one pair of stations, and on this axis here, I'm showing you the metagenomic dissimilarity, that is, how different those two stations are, how many, what proportion of the of the DNA sequence reads do not match. So the higher they are, the, the more different the co two communities are. The lower it is, the more similar the communities are. On this axis, I'm showing you how long it takes 
to get from point A to point B from the two stations that were being compared. So station number, say, 79 before and 150, what is the minimum amount of time it takes traveling along the currents to get between those two points? And you can see globally there, there's, there appears to be some amount of correlation. Uh, but the question is, um, what does this look like when we examine the currents in more detail? So we know that the currents do not more move uniformly across the planet. So there might be a difference between two communities that are, say, separated by one year in time versus two communities that are separated by 10 years in time. So we want to know what is the time signature of this movement along currents. And the way we'll do that is by restricting the correlation to various sets of time. So for example, we'll restrict the correlation to any pairs of stations that are separated by half a year or less. So we'll calculate the correlation here. And then we'll calculate the correlation at one year only these pairs of stations. And then we'll calculate the, the correlation at say five years, only these pairs of stations. And then we can plot that. So the plot I'll show you is that plot for all the size fractions put together. And this is what it looks like. So uh, in blue is this 0 0.8 to 5 micron size fraction, uh, the smallest uh, eukaryote enriched size fraction. And you can see that the correlation for stations that are separated by one year in time is say 0.48, whereas the correlation uh, ri rises to close to 0.6 for, for, for those that are separated by 1.5 years in time. And the thing that really surprised us when we looked at this plot was that all of the size fractions, although we know they have very different biology, a virus has a very different biology from a small copepod, they all have this peak at 1.5 years. So that's mystery number three. How is it that all these organisms, which with very different biology and ecology, show this same time signature of community composition difference as they travel along the currents? So, okay, so now we've got our three mysteries. Now we can start investigating what's going on. So to talk about, to think about size differences, what we can do is ask what's going on, say for this large size fraction, 180 to 2000, versus 0 0.8 to 5, this one here, what's going on within those 1.5 years. So what we'll do is we'll take a set of stations that are separated between uh, uh, by 1.5 years or less, and we'll plot, we'll make a scatter plot of the dissimilarity versus travel time. Here I'm showing similarity instead of dissimilarity because we want to use it to calculate a decay. So what you can see here is that the correlation within that 1.5 years is actually, is actually quite high for the 0 0.8 to 5 micron uh, plankton and lower for the, uh, for the 180 to 2000 plankton that was affected on the previous chart. Uh, but not only that, if you calculate the slope of the decay time, that is how long does it take the community to change, uh, you see that the slope is different. In fact, actually the larger organisms, their slope uh, is the, uh, the turnover time is twice the turnover time for the smaller organisms. That means as they travel along the currents, something is happening to these smaller organisms or these smaller organism communities are changing at twice the rate as are the larger organisms. And that sort of goes a little bit of the way to start explaining mystery number two, which is why do you get these differences in community biogeography sizes? And um, our first hint here is that the community, uh, sort of the whole community of larger organisms is changing more slowly. And that would lead to larger biogeographical provinces, okay? so. Uh, now let's ask about nutrients, okay? How are nutrients changing over time? So here I'll show the same plot that I showed before, except I'm sticking all six uh, organismal size fractions together. So this is just sort of an average of all the different plankton size fractions because I'm gonna compare it with nutrients and temperature. If you do this, if you ask the same question, how do differences in nutrients correlate with travel time? You actually get a similar curve. So nutrients, traveling along through the ocean also have a peak at 1.5 years. And if you think about it, this makes sense because the nutrients and the plankton are both being carried along with the currents. So the nutrients show the same signature. However, if you look at temperature, it looks quite different. There is no peak at 1.5 years and actually the maximum correlation is at 10 years or more. And this also makes sense because we know that the temperature, uh, especially at the, the, the surface, which is what was sampled and close to the surface, uh, the temperature depends more, more on solar irradiance than it does on the actual contents of the water. Okay, um, we'll do uh, one, last, one last slide of accumulating data before we try and solve all these mysteries at once. Um, and we'll propose, I'll propose a hypothesis. 
Okay, so we know that uh, nutrients and, and temperature behave differently as they travel along the currents, but the comparison, the last comparison we haven't shown you is how does beta diversity compare to nutrients and temperature along travel time? So here I'm showing you the same type of plot that I've showed you before, but here I'm showing you the correlation of beta diversity, that is the differences between community structure and nutrients, as how that changes over time. And what you can see here is that there's a higher correlation for smaller plankton with nutrients at short, short, shorter time scales, okay? And at longer time scales, there's a higher correlation with temperature. And so this is sort of what we think of as the uh, one of the missing pieces to understand the mystery of, of mystery number two of, uh, of geographical size ranges of plankton communities is that smaller plankton, many of which are photosynthetic, depend directly on the nutrients that are being carried along the currents with them. And of course, that they're modifying those concentrations as they travel. And so you have this shorter time scale effect where you have these smaller plankton that are dependent on nutrients and that may have shorter lifespans. On the other hand, you have these, the temperature effect is more pronounced in the larger organisms. And um, this has been something that's known for a long time actually, is that there's this, uh, these laws uh, governing uh, temperature and, and body scaling and things like that. So you have these larger plankton whose communities are changing slower and the differences that we observe are the larger scale differences in temperature, which is how we get these sort of big biogeographical ranges. And if you plot them on the map, then they, they sort of plot out with temperature. Okay, but that still hasn't addressed this sort of mystery of the 1.5 years, so, and the stability. <clears throat> and our hypothesis for this is that uh, the ocean uh, actually doesn't always move in, say, one, one direction. Uh, it's a simple way of putting it. Actually, within each uh, gyre, so here's the South Atlantic gyre, the North Atlantic gyre with the Gulf Stream that we saw earlier, um, there's actually that recirculation that happens. So you follow these arrows here, there's recirculation. And um, maybe you can guess at what the average global recirculation time within an ocean gyre is um, uh, across all the different uh, basins, it's 1.5 years. So the hypothesis is that what basically what, what what's, this is, these gyres are sort of like big blenders th that um, any given plankton community sort of changes slowly over time uh, um, uh, as it moves through. But um, within 1.5 years means you're still sort of inside the gyre. However, when you escape the gyre and move to a different gyre, then you're in a different regime where you, the, the travel time between here and here is more than 1.5 years, for example. Uh, and that causes the correlation to drop sort of rapidly. And we, this is a hypothesis. We were able to test it a little bit, is that if you take the data that we have from different ocean gyres um, and you recalculate the, the position at which there's the maximum correlation, um, the, the maximum correlation actually occurs at a different time. And that matches up with the average recirculation time within those gyres. So for the example, there's gyres that, where the recirculation time is say, uh, higher than 1.5 years, and there's other gyres where it's lower than 1.5 years, for example. And we see that there is a match between uh, the peak of maximum correlation and the average recirculation time within the gyre. Okay, so hopefully this hypothesis and me waving my hands uh, is enough to convince you um, that we have some, we have some uh, more idea of what's going on in, in ocean plankton uh, uh, than we did uh, before the start of, the, of this project. Okay. So um, the next thing I'm going to tell you about is, okay, the plankton appear to form these, what we think are stable communities. What are they doing in those communities? And for that, we'll turn to mRNA data. So the idea of the mRNA data is it represents actively transcribed mRNA that's going to code for a gene that's going to do something. So we can use it as a readout of plankton activity. What are the plankton doing? The only problem is that we're faced with the same lack of reference uh, data as we, as we were with the genomes. So there's probably something like 500,000 or so species uh, in, in, in just in the surface ocean, just for protist plankton, and we have about 500 references. So we're really, really short on references. So how can we design a method that will allow us to make a guess as to who the different sequences in this metatranscriptomic data belong to? And the way we'll do that is by using a phylogenetic approach to read mapping. So here I'm just, I'm drawing a phylogenetic tree and each of the leaves on this tree represents a reference genome or transcriptome. And we know that these reference genomes or transcriptomes probably are not an exact match for the species that are present in the ocean, but they're probably related to those organisms. 
So the idea is that what we do is we map a read to a given gene, and then we ask where it belongs on this tree, but we can map to internal nodes. So the idea here is that species A and species B here that I'm showing you with my pointer are both in the database. This sequence that we have, the random meta transcriptomic sequence, doesn't match either of those, but it's close, it's likely to be more closely related to these two species than any other species in the tree. And so we can infer that it's present in some other species that may be the sister here. And this information uh, on one read might not be useful, um, but what we can do is we can sum it across all the reads and give us, give us an idea of sort of the taxonomy of the species that are present, okay? Um, the other advantage of, of a phylogenetic approach to read mapping is that actually we can retain all the uncertainty, so we don't have to worry about um, BLAST and identity score cutoffs and things like that. We can just sort of say, okay, where does this read belong in the tree? And if it, will, if it might go in two different places, we save that uncertainty for later. And because we're summing across all the reads, so trillions of reads, um, it'll allow us to get a picture globally of what's happening, especially uh, with the certainty getting higher at higher taxonomic levels, that is closer to the root of the tree. Okay, so I've tried to explain to you why I think the approach um, is useful for this purpose. So what does it give us? So what we did is we did this approach across all the stations in the ocean, and we did it for 300 conserved genes. And this is what we get. So the reason we chose conserved genes is because they're likely to be highly expressed. Um, they're likely to be single copy, and they're likely to be present in most of the species that we sampled. And this is what it looks like. So each size fraction is a big rectangle, and within that size fraction is divided by sort of major taxonomic lineage, and it's the proportion of the total transcription across all the oceans that are, is done by that lineage. So um, the first thing you might say is, okay, this is a bunch of pretty colors. How do you know that it corresponds to anything that is the truth? So the first thing that we did is compared our metatranscriptomic data to the meta barcoding data from the V9 region of the 18S gene. And there's actually a remarkable correspondence. Um, so um, you can just sort of glance between the two and match up the colors, and you can see that um, on at the level, the very high taxonomic level that is sort of eukaryotic groups and supergroups, there seems to be a pretty good correspondence between the V9 data and the metatranscriptomic data that tells us that our, we're probably on track, um, on the right track. Either that or, or, or both of the data are wrong, but, but hopefully that's not the case. Okay, so what, what can we do? Um, what, what are the first things that sort of jump out at us at being interesting in these data? So the first two things that jumped out at us uh, in these data are uh, the, in the two smaller size fractions. Um, so first of all, um, about a third almost uh, of the total transcription that's happening in the surface ocean of conserved genes in this smallest size fraction here is done by alveolus, in particular dinoflagellates. Um, and if you, those of you who may not have heard of dinoflagellates, um, dinoflagellates, for example, are among the species that are most prevalently associated with uh, red tide. Um, and for example, bioluminescent bays are, are, are the bioluminescence comes from uh, dinoflagellates. Uh, but one thing about dinoflagellates is that there's very, very few characterized species that are smaller than five microns, which basically tells us that one third of the transcription that's happening in the entire surface ocean across the planet is being done by unknown dinoflagellates that um, we, we just don't know what they are. They haven't been characterized so far by science. Okay, um, the next thing that jumped out at, out at us is another sort of size mismatch in that metazoa animals appear to be the largest, uh, the, the largest transcriptionally active group in the five to 20 micron size fraction. And those of you who study animals know that animals are quite a bit larger than 20 microns. So what could be going on here? And remember, the, this is, this is metatranscriptomic data, which means that it's being actively transcribed. So one guess um, is that it could be, for example, sperm and egg cells. So it could be that, that marine sperm uh, is transcriptionally active. Um, and what we're capturing here is, uh, is, is a signature of, uh, of transcriptionally active uh, reproductive cells uh, in animals. And I was giving this talk, um, uh, once and someone came up from the audience afterwards and he said um, that uh, he has a friend who works on sharks, ocean sharks, and uh, some, not all sharks, but some sharks reproduce uh, with sperm and egg exterior to the body, um, but nobody really seems to know where sharks reproduce in the open ocean. And so the idea is that if these are really sperm and egg, well then we can add some sharks into the database and map against the sharks, and if we get shark sperm and egg um, and, and, uh, and it's located in a particular point in the ocean, well, that'll tell us 
um, that we there's a good guess as to actually where sharks reproduce in the open ocean. Okay, um, so this is this is this is the, the sort of two first things that jumped out at us. What about if we take these same charts uh, and we break them up by where they are in the ocean? So here you're seeing the same colors and you're seeing the same size fractions, but what we're doing is we're going across different parts of the ocean. So this is the Mediterranean, um, this is the northern part of the Indian Ocean, uh, the southern part of the Atlantic, for example. And the, the, the thing that um, I found a little bit surprising when I looked at this is actually the partitioning of transcriptional activity among major lineages across the ocean appears remarkably stable. It's not necessarily the same organisms within those lineages that are doing it, but actually there isn't that much change among the major lineages who are doing transcription in the ocean, with the exception of uh, the Antarctic. So ACC is here is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and ANT is the is, is samples in the Antarctic. And you can see, for example, in the 5 to 20 size fraction, you see there's a, a, a large contribution of stromenopiles. And this makes sense because uh, diatoms are among stromenopiles, and Tara is, is, happens to have sampled during a diatom bloom uh, in the Southern Ocean here. So that makes sense. Okay. But, um, but besides the Antarctic, it's, it's, it's uh, remarkably stable, in my opinion. Um, so th these are conserved genes, so they're housekeeping genes. So they're telling us that the cell is sort of alive and ticking, but there's nothing preventing us from taking any gene. And so here I'm going to show you an example of a gene that does not have a housekeeping function, uh, in particular silicon transport. So I showed you uh, uh, this loricate quantiflagellate earlier. Here is uh, the same species, Dauphinica grandis. Here you see two cells, and here you see in blue the lorica being stained. And besides being beautiful, maybe at least to me, um, uh, the feature that I want uh, to look at here is that these uh, strips, uh, which go on to make the lorica, are actually s synthesized within the cell. And so in order to make these strips, the, the cell has to transport silica from outside, um, that's in the ocean, to inside. And so the question is, how do they do that? So there's uh, quantiflagellates have a gene for that, and actually many eukaryote species and some bacteria have a gene for that. It's called a silicon transporter. And a few years ago, we sequenced um, uh, a bunch of quantiflagellates, and, and we found that, that actually the quantiflagellates that have this structure called a lorica have two copies. So they have this alpha and beta copy. And uh, so, for example, here you see nudiform and tectiform are two different types of quantiflagellates. You don't have to worry about that too much. But you can see that this, within the set of six, six species, there's uh, at least one copy of alpha in each and at least one copy of beta. And when we looked at the expression data, we found that the alpha expression is significantly higher than the beta expression in all the species in the conditions that they were grown. So what we decided to do was do a test to see how the alpha and beta might respond in regimes of different silica, silicon concentration. And we picked uh, the species Stephanoica diplocostata, and we we're going to compare its alpha to its beta in high silicon and low silicon. And there is also the experimenter here. Um, so what you can see is in conditions of low silicon concentration, you see that the alpha is overexpressed relative to control concentrations. But the beta doesn't seem to have any significant change. Conversely, in regimes of high silicon concentration, the alpha appears to be downregulated, whereas there doesn't appear to be a significant change in the beta. And the reason that these error bars are so big is because the expression is very, very low uh, to begin with. So that leads us to a hypothesis. So uh, our hypothesis is that alpha is the principal silicon transporter and its expression should anti-correlate with silicon concentration, as we saw from our experiment in the lab. That is, the higher the concentration, the less of, of the transporter you need to make. The second part of the hypothesis is that beta is the sensor. Its expression doesn't change, and its expression is not very high. So basically, the sensor is responsible for always being uh, present at a low level, and when the sensor detects high levels of silicon, then it says, okay, we need to make less transporter. And conversely, in lower levels of silicon, it needs to make more of the transporter. So the idea is that we can use the data we have from Tara to test this hypothesis on a sort of global scale. Because Tara, along her route, collected data on silicon concentration. So here you see the bluer you are, the higher concentration. So if we were to say have a peak at this station here, say this station here and the stations in the Antarctic, we should see that the expression of uh, the alpha goes down. And 
Uh, here I'll show you what that looks like uh, that with actual reads mapped on an actual tree. So here's the same tree that we saw before. We have the beta genes here, and we have the alpha genes here. So the idea is that um, if this hypothesis is going to be supported by the data, that the beta expression should always be lower than the alpha expression, and that in places where we have higher silicon concentration, you should see fewer reads mapping to the alpha, and in places where you have lower silicon concentration, you should see it being higher. And um, one of the things this tree illustrates is that um, the, the idea of mapping to internal nodes. So we know that there's about more than 100 species uh, described of lorikeet quantiflagellates, um, and we only have six sequenced. And so when you see mapping to an uh, internal node here, that tells us that we're mapping to some species that is a quantum flagellate, but isn't in our sequence database. Okay, so let's go for a ride. So here what, we'll, what, what we're doing is you see the number of reads that are mapped to each each node in the tree changing across the, the route that Tara actually took across the ocean. So the first thing we should look for is when it gets to a station around here that there should be a drop in expression. Oh, there it goes, it went down. Okay, the next place is right off the Horn of Africa. It should go down, oh, it went down again. And the next thing we're looking for is that the expression um, of the alpha should go down um, as we get into the Antarctic. And hopefully it will. Oh, yes, so it's going down with the exception of one station, <laughs> um, which we need to look into. Um, and you can see overall in general that the uh, alpha expression is, is higher than the beta expression. And I'm showing you this one example uh, because uh, with data that we had on hand and a hypothesis that we thought we could try and test. Oh, and by the way, I'm showing you this movie, but if you actually, if you actually do the plot and, uh, and test it, um, then, then the hypothesis checks out. But I think this is a little more maybe interesting way to, to, to present the data. Um, but this can be done with any gene, and so actually in the future, I think it'd be really interesting to take any gene um, whose expression you might be curious about in the case in the open ocean, um, either its, its geographic distribution or how it responds to different regimes of nutrients, and ask what its expression, what it expression look, looks like in the open ocean in a phylogenetic context. Okay, so um, hopefully um, I've convinced you that the plankton form what we think are probably stable. Uh, um, differentiated uh, biological communities in the world's oceans uh, with larger plankton uh, forming communities with larger geographical extents, um, probably having to do with their relationship to being less linked to, say, nutrients and more linked to temperature. And that circulation is the strongest influence on, on plankton community structure on the scale of ocean basins. But on larger time scales, temperature exerts a stronger influence. Um, so that was sort of part one. In part two, um, we show that um, we can use this uh, metatranscriptomic phylogenetic approach, um, um, and the proof of principle is that um, the, the metabarcoding data and the metatranscriptomic data show a, a provide a, a consistent summary of the most active microbial plankton. And then just as an example gene, I showed you the silicon transporter um, with some evidence supporting the hypothesis that there's functional diversification of the two classes of silicon transport. Um, and sort of the, 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 the road is open for testing sort of any gene um, once we get the, the sort of kink, final kinks worked out. Um, so I'll show you the acknowledgments and then there's two bonus slides, um, which we have time for. So um, the TARA is an absolutely enormous um, consortium um, and there's lots of people that were involved from the people who actually did get to, to go on the boat to the people who uh, stored the samples and, and sequenced the samples and so on and so forth. And the people in bold you, you see are the ones that participated uh, in the biogeography project, um, and then uh, uh, Fabian and Jürgen in the metatranscriptomic project, and lots of other people all over the world and funding. Okay, so bonus slides. Um, so um, we'll mention that, that I'll be um, starting my group next year, um, and I wanted to tell you about what we'll be doing. Um, so uh, one thing I didn't tell you about um, the, the plankton is is the distribution of uh, the, the amount of species that are present in their abundance. So um, what you're showing, what I'm showing you here, uh, is from a paper in 2015 on metabarcoding data that um, that with on this axis the number of stations in which an OTU, quote unquote, a species was observed and its total abundance. So what you see here is a station, a, a blue dot represents a sample, or uh, sorry, an OTU that was present in 40 of the stations globally. Um, and what you can see here is, is this relationship between the number of, of stations observed and abundance, to the point where there's this subset where uh, of only 0.1% of the total OTUs, so only 0.1% or less of the total, say, 500,000, that are super abundant. And this is a log scale. So actually, 
only just these, say, 100 are half of the, of the total global abundance, which means that they're probably pretty eco ecologically important. Yet, 92 out of these 100 are unknown. And what do I mean by unknown is that we don't have a picture of them. We have a DNA sequence, but we don't know what it matches to. Eight are known and in culture, and th they can be studied. But the other 92 that are probably really important for the ecology of the surface ocean, we just have to throw our hands up and say, well, it probably belongs to this lineage, but we don't really know. So that's what we'll be up to in the next five years, is try and hunt them down and get them into lab and study their biology. So the idea is to make them into model organisms um, in order to study the ecology of the surface ocean, um, because whatever conclusions we make about their biology, because they're so abundant, should have implications for the ecology of the surface ocean. And also, um, because they're protists, um, they are probably going to tell us cool things about eukaryotic evolution. So do they have cool ex extracellular structures? What's, what genes are in their genome? What do they interact with? So on and so forth. So over the next five years, we'll be sort of uh, going after these sort of most abundant um, organisms in, the, in these various lineages. And I asked Alberto, and he said it wouldn't be too crass of me to advertise that um, for this project, we'll be looking for uh, graduate students and postdocs, um, and I'll probably start advertising next year. So if you or, or anyone you know is interested in going on a hunt for the most abundant organisms, the most abundant protists in the, in the surface ocean, then um, stay tuned. Um, and with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, questions from the audience. That was, that was a great talk. Thanks. Great talk. I actually had a question about like your final next steps that you were doing. Um, with the, you said 92 of those species aren't known. Do you know where those fall into under the protist categories? Like, do you know if they fall into or the aviolids or the metazoans? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, great question. Um, so 75% um, of them fall into a known lineage. Some of them closer or farther from known species. So what we can do is we can say, what we have is a barcode, and we can say how closely does that barcode match a species that's described. And in some cases, it's very close, enough for us to know that it's not that organism, but probably, say, a sister. So um, it might be type of diet, you know, some diatom X. Instead, it's actually diatom Y. Um, um, and so for 75% of the cases, we're able to classify them um, at, into one eukaryotic lineage, but for 25% of the cases, we're not. Um, oh. That could either mean that they're unknown lineages of eukaryotes, which is possible and I wouldn't rule it out, or it could just mean that either the v and reference database we have isn't complete enough, or there's not enough resolution in, that, in the short V9 sequence to actually tell us what organism this is, that it is. So it'd be really cool if we found an, an unknown lineage, and, and those are still being discovered. They're actually new lineages of eukaryotes, in quotes, are discovered about the rate of, of one, or one every year or two. So it could be that we find a new lineage. But my guess is the bulk of them will sort of be members of groups that we know of, but we just haven't studied them yet. Very cool. Thank you. OK, I've got sort of two questions. One is just a clarification on my understanding of the time signature data. Mm -hmm. so, so you had these stations in which you had a pretty fine resolution of timing differences, right? Like you, your x axis in which you were like plotting the time difference between communities it was like, seems like it had pretty high resolution. And you keep referring to stations. Did, 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 at the sampling points, did Terra actually leave static stations, or are you calculating the difference in, say, current time between two different positions? Yeah, yeah. you see this travel time. How, how are you getting travel time? So, so that's a good question. So actually, sometimes uh, the sampling took a while. So for especially for the 5 to 20 micron um, size fraction, uh, it's, it just has a lot less material in there. So they had to sample over a longer period. Um, um, and that has two results. One is that um, that the different fractions are actually sampled at different uh, coordinates. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and also that you sort of have to make an average coordinate for where that thing was sampled. Mm -hmm. So we, we have those data. But in terms of the, the minimum travel time that's reflected here, um, what you see is this is 0.1 is you know, 0.1 years. Um, and this just reflects two stations that happen to be sampled at, uh, very close to one another. So gotcha. um, 
uh, globally, the stations were pretty far apart, but sometimes they decided to do little mini experiments. Um, so there's islands in the South Pacific where the concentration of iron is very low, um, sort of as the current approaches the island and then higher as the current passes the island because actually the iron fertilization is done by the island itself. And so at those points, they actually sample things that were quite close together um, in order to have a sort of do an experiment of before and after iron fertilization, uh, natural iron fertilization. But gotcha. to answer the question about how we actually got the data is, I, I maybe forgot to mention this, but it's actually from, from a simulation. It's from the simulation that I showed in the video. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so, um, so the simulation, as far as I understand it, is pretty good. Um, uh, and what we did is we, for every pair of Tara stations, we sort of dropped artificial buoys in the water. And then we asked within the simulation how long they, they took to get from station A to station B. And that was our definition of minimum travel time. Cool. Okay, cool. That's, that's what I assumed was happening, but I, yeah, I might have just missed it. Um, and then the second question, you, you had this like overall global peak at one and a half years, which you attribute to the sort of resonance frequency of a gyre. Uh, do you not see that one and a half years in the non-gyre parts of the ocean? Like, do, is this peak absent if you're not looking at the gyres? Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to escape from it and tell you that we didn't have enough sampling, I don't think, to answer that question. And also, I'm sort of an amateur oceanographer. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, my the oceanography colleagues who are involved in this project with, with us, um, uh, uh, were pretty focused on the gyres and they mm -hmm. would probably know which of the samples might be the ones to look at, but actually mm -hmm. I wouldn't know which samples we took that are outside gotcha. the gyres. Gotcha. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Cool. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, uh, let's all thank Daniel again for coming. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you.